Okie dokie. So now that we've talked about how atoms come together and form bonds, after you get, and then we talked about Lewis structures and how we can, you know, construct a Lewis structure, you know, with groups of atoms and bonds and all that. Now the next part, let's take that two dimensional Lewis structure and we're going to use that to build a 3D model of this molecule that we're looking at. So this part of chemistry that we're looking at is called molecular geometry. Okay, and so molecular geometry, this is the 3D arrangement of atoms in a molecule. Okay, and the reason why we study this and it's so important to us is that once we know the 3D structure, once we know the molecular geometry, then we have a way to predict the chemical and physical properties like melting points, densities, and then types of reactions. So this is really important because once we understand a compound's molecular geometry, that gives us a lot of insight into how these compounds are going to behave. So we can predict a molecule's molecular geometry based on the number of electron pairs surrounding the central atom. And so the basis of what we're going to talk about, uh, we're, what we're going to talk about today in this video is that based on this theory, we're assuming that the valence shell electrons repel one another. And, and that makes sense because when you have a negative charge with a negative charge, they're going to repel each other. So the basis of everything that we're going to talk about today is that, that the, when you have these valence shells, electrons, whether they're bonding electrons or non-bonding electrons, they're going to repel each other some way, shape, or form. Now, just so we're on the same page, I know we, I know you guys know this, but just in case, valence electrons, these are the outermost electrons. So these are either the dots that you're putting around the atoms or these are the bonds themselves. All right. So the geometry that the molecules assume minimizes all of the repulsions from other atoms or electron pairs. So the approach that we're going to use today is called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory or VSEPR, VESPER. Okay. So again, the full name is called valence shell electron pair repulsion. And again, the, the, it, the name kind of gives it away that we're trying to we're trying to repel the electron pairs around an atom. So this accounts for the geometric arrangement of electron pairs from a, around a central atom. Electron uh, geometric arrangement of electron pairs around a central atom. Okay. Now, there are two things that we've got to keep in mind that we use when we follow Vesper theory. Okay. So the two rules. All right. And here's the first one. As far as electron pair repulsion goes, there is no difference between single, double, or triple bonds. So in fact, 
we treat all bonds as if they were single bonds. All right, so that's the first thing that we use with, a, with Vesper Theory. We assume that if you've got a double or a triple or a single bond, whatever you got, it's going to be treated like a single bond. Okay. Here's the second thing. If a molecule has two or more resonance structures, we can apply Vesper Theory to any one of them and we get the same answer. All right, cool. So we got to follow a guide that we have to use. We have to follow a guide to uh, to apply Vesper theory. So here's the here it is. It's pretty simple. I like this one. First one, write the Lewis structure. Okay, I can't stress this one enough. You got to write the Lewis structure. I've been doing this for many years. I still have to draw out the Lewis structure, so you can't necessarily do these in your mind. All right, so that's the first one. Write out the Lewis structure. Get the 2D representation on paper. And then after that, we then determine how many electron pairs are around the central atom. Now, the electron pairs, we're talking about bonding, and we're talking about lone pairs. Okay? So, those are the, we want to figure out lone pairs, we want to figure out bonding, how many electron pairs are around the central atom. Okay? And then, once we do that, we're going to use tables. Um, for us, it's going to be table 10.1 and 10.2 from the textbook, but all textbooks are different, so it all depends on what book you're looking at. But there's a there's several tables. We're actually going to recreate some of them in in our notes. So you just follow the, the table in your notes, and you go from there. And then basically apply that shape. So what we're going to do is actually make three passes in uh, when we're talking about Valen, uh, Vesper theory. So the first pass, what we're going to do is assume that there's no valent, there's no lone pairs around the central atom. Okay, so we're going to keep it as simple as possible. We're only going to talk about bonding electrons, no lone pairs. The second time, then we're going to introduce the lone pairs. So what happens when you have a mixture of bonding pairs and lone pairs? What do those shapes look like? And then the third time is that we're going to talk about what if you have more than one central atom in a molecule. Okay, so there we go. So we're going to make three passes. First part, we assume that there's no lone pairs. Second part, there's a mixture of lone pairs and bonding pairs. Third part, you've got more than one central atom. All right, so the way that we're going to take a look at this, I want to look at a generic compound first. So we're going to say that the central atom is going to be, we're going to call this A. Okay, it could be any atom you're going to have B outside atoms. So B is your outside atom, and then what I'm going to do is write as a subscript X. Now, this is going to tell us how many outside atoms we've got connected to A. Okay, so the, we're going to, when we create this chart, we're going to write this in terms of a generic compound ABX, where X, this is the number of outside atoms that surround A. Okay. All right, so that being said, let's start it. So we've got a table here. So we've got the number of electron pairs and electronic arrangement, molecular geometry, bond angles, and examples. So what if the first compound that we deal with, you've got two lone pair, or two bonding pairs of electrons. So that means you've got two outside atoms. So I'm going to write AB2 for the electronic arrangement. So the example of this would be something like beryllium dichloride. So you have beryllium in the middle, and you've got two chlorines on either side. 
Okay. So Vesper theory wants to keep the chlorines as far away from each other as possible. And so the only way that they can be as far apart from each other as possible is if they form an angle, they're positioned so that way they form a 180 degree angle away from each other. So I'm also going to make a note about the angles here. Okay. And so that molecular geometry is called linear. And the bond angle is 180 degrees. All right. So that's our first shape. What if we go from two electron pairs? What if there's three bonds? So you've got three outside atoms this time. So AB3. So an example of this would be like boron trifluoride, where you've got three fluorine atoms connected to a boron atom. Okay, and let me draw that in. So these angles, in order to position themselves so that they repel each other, the you know, they we minimize the repel, repulsions, that angle should be 120 degrees for each of the BF3s. And so this shape is called trigonal planar. Okay. So that's the third shape. That's your second shape. What if you have four bonds? So this would be, you'd have four outside atoms, A, B, four. What that would look like, it would be something like methane, where you have carbon in the middle, and you're going to have hydrogen on top, like almost in a straight line. And then almost at the four o'clock position, you have another hydrogen. Now for the other two, you're going to have one hydrogen coming out towards us. So the way I show that, that it's coming out towards us, is that I make a solid wedge. I put that hydrogen there. So that way it's, it, it's like it's coming out towards us. And then to show that something's behind us, I'm going to make another wedge, but this time I'm going to use a series of hash lines to show that this is behind us. All right, so that's CH4. The angles for all of these, the, the angle that's going to be minimized the most, that we can position all these at, these these outside atoms and their minim the repulsions are minimized, the angle should be 109.5 degrees. Okay. And that shape is called tetrahedral. All right. So those are the basic shapes. Okay. And this is assuming that we are following the octet rule. The next two happen when we violate octet. So let's say you have five electron pairs, okay, or five bonds. So you got five outside atoms, AB5. So an example of this is having PF5, where you have a phosphorus in the middle. You're going to have uh, two fluorines pretty much opposite each other at 180 degrees from each other. At 90 degrees, you're going to have another fluorine. And then you're going to have two other fluorines coming off. So it's actually going to be a combination of linear and trigonal planar. So you're going to have, you're going to have an angle here. One angle that's possible is going to be 90 degrees. Okay, so you're going to have a 90 degree angle between three of the phosphorus and fluorine combinations. The other part between these two and between this fluorine to that fluorine, that other angle combination is going to be 120 degrees. Okay, and so this shape is trigonal pyramidal, uh, trigonal bipyramidal. So you have two different angles that's possible. Finally, what if you have six bonds, okay, or six outside atoms, okay? So an example of that would be SF6, where, again, we're going to create this by having sulfur in the middle and two of the fluorines standing up and, and straight up and down from each, from each other, so you form 180 degrees. At 90 degrees, I'm going to put another fluorine, so it looks like everything's 100 and, you know, everything's 90 degrees away from each other. And then we've got bonds coming out towards us. Okay. 
So literally everything is 90 degrees in this structure. And so this shape is called octahedral. Okay, so these are the basic shapes that you've got to use when we're talking about Vesper theory. So these you must know. You must know these, especially if you are going on further into chemistry. These are these are things that you have to have to have to know. Now that we've taken a look at the basic shapes for Vesper theory, let's now see what happens when we add in lone pairs to the mix. What kind of new shapes do we get? So before we get into those shapes, we got to talk about the repulsive forces. So it turns out that there's three different types of repulsive forces inside a molecule around its central atom. So you could have bonding pair versus bonding pair. And that's what we dealt with previously. Okay, You could have bonding pair versus lone pair. Okay, and you can have lone pair versus lone pair. Okay, so it tends to see, you know, and, and like I said, the first one, bonding pair versus bonding pair, that's what we use to generate the model that we talked about previously. Okay, now what we're going to start seeing, though, is now we're going to add in the lone pairs to the mix. So what happens? Which one is actually going to repel the most? And it turns out that the way that we have this list listed, it actually it looks like it increases going down. So lone pair versus lone pair, they repel the most. And bonding pair versus bonding pair, they're the least repelled. So when we're dealing, when we're taking everything into account, we really got to make sure that the lone pairs are far apart from each other as possible. And the bonding pairs, they too need to be far further apart. But if they're a little bit closer, it's not the end of the world. So in so all that being said, we're going to take a look this time. But now we got to keep, you know, when we take a look at the generic formula, we got to keep it, keep an eye on how many electron pairs do we actually have. Okay. All right. So, uh, so we're going to set this up. This table is going to look pretty similar to the one that we just dealt with. The only difference is, is now that we're going to keep track of the number of electron pairs, how many of them are bonds and how many of them are lone pairs. And the other thing that we're going to talk about is also the electronic arrangement versus the molecular geometry. So the difference between these two, the molecular geometry is including the lone pairs. Okay. So what would the shape be with the bonds and the lone pairs? We treat the lone pairs as if it was a bond to another atom. Okay. The molecular geometry, we ignore the lone pairs. What shape do we have now? All right, so let's take a look at this. What if you have a compound like that has two outside atoms, so it's AB2, and then you have one electron pair, okay? So you're going to have a total of three electron pairs. Two of them are going to be bonds. One of them will be a lone pair. So an example of this is something like SO2, okay, where you're going to have sulfur that's in a double bond, to two oxygens, okay, so you have two double bonds there, and then you have a sulfur that's going to have a lone pair. Okay, so if you have three electron pairs, according to the previous chart, three lone pairs, or three electron pairs, tell us it's trigonal planar, so the angle should be close to 120 degrees, okay? So the electronic arrangement, what we expect is that it's going to be trigonal planar. Okay, and that we want the angles to be about 120 degrees. The molecular geometry, this is what we consider if we take away the lone pair. So what are we left with? This shape is called bent. Okay, and the angles for this, they're going to be slightly just below 120 degrees. All right.
So that's our first shape. Now, what if you have three outside atoms, okay, so AB3, and you got one lone pair. So now you have a total of four electron pairs, three of them are bonds, one lone pair. Well, if you have four electron pairs, what we looked at the previous uh, page was that this should be tetrahedral. Okay, so that should be a tetrahedral shape. The angles should be 109.5 degrees. We expect that. Okay. We, we, we think it should be around 109.5 degrees. Example of this would be like NH3, ammonia. So for NH3, we would treat it just like it was tetrahedral. So you got nitrogen that's going to have a bond to a lone pair. And then you're going to have one hydrogen that's in the plane, one coming out towards us, and then one behind us. Okay. Now, if we take away that lone pair, so we consider its molecular geometry. Okay. What we're left with, this shape is called trigonal pyramidal. And the angles for the hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen bonds, this angle is going to be actually a 107.3 degrees. Okay. So let me let me also put that angle. Let's let's put that uh, 109.5. Let me write that with the tetrahedral. Okay. All right. So what if you have two bonds and two lone pairs? So you still have a total of four. You have two bonds, two lone pairs. So you've got this compound would be AB2E2. All right. So in this case, you know, because it has four electron pairs total, we'd expect it to be tetrahedral. We'd expect angles of 109.5 degrees. Okay. So this would be like water. Okay, so if, if oxygen is a central atom, you're going to have the hydrogens coming out towards you and behind you. You're going to have a bond to a lone pair and another bond to another lone pair. So it looks something like that. Okay, but if I take away those lone pairs, so if I, if I ignore the lone pairs, what is the result, resulting shape? Well, this too is also called bent. And the angle that we see, the angle between the hydrogens and the oxygen, that bond angle should be 104.5 degrees. Okay. All right, let's try one more. What if you had five total electron pairs? Four of them are bonds, one's a lone pair. So this would be AB4E1. Okay. So according to the according to the last chart, if you have five electron pairs, that shape was called trigonal bipyramidal. Okay, and so the example of what we want to look at for this one, this is uh, let's look at SF four. So you're going to have sulfur in the middle, bonded to fluor uh, to two fluorines top and bottom, and then you're going to have two other fluorines that are kind of like scissoring out, and then you've got a lone pair. So you got something like that. So that would be your geom that would be your electronic arrangement. To get to the molecular geometry, we ignore the lone pair. So I'm going to take them away. So the resulting shape that we get, this is called seesaw. Okay. Now the angles for this are going to be a little bit more complicated because remember for trigonal bipyramidal you had angles of 100 of 90 degrees and then also angles of 120 degrees. So for this one the angles are going to be a little bit more confusing. Don't sweat that. Now we can get more and more specific. So we only went over four other shapes including lone pairs. So we, we can get a we can get way into this. We can take a look at octahedral and see what happens when we have six lone pairs. You know, so it can get real crazy. But this is about as far as I'm gonna go 
with the with Vesper theory and the shapes that you're going to be responsible for. Okay. All right. So before we end this, I want to talk about one more topic. What if you have an atom? What if you have a molecule that has more than one central atom? If you have a molecule that has more than one central atom, the best thing to do is to describe the geometry for each of the central atoms. So an example of this is methanol. So you've got, for methanol, you're going you're to have a carbon as one of your central atoms bonded to a hydrogen, bonded to an oxygen, okay? And so off of this carbon, you're going to have a hydrogen coming out towards you, a hydrogen going away from you, and off of the oxygen, you're going to have another hydrogen coming out, you know, going along that plane. And then oxygen is going to have two lone pairs. Okay. So what we want to do is talk about the molecular geometries around the central atoms. In this case, you have really two central atoms. You've got the carbon and you've got the oxygen. So carbon has four bonds, no lone pairs. So that would be tetrahedral. And the angles are, are 109.5 degrees. Okay. For the oxygen, you've got two bonds and two lone pairs. And so that shape is going to be bent. And that angle should be around 104.5 degrees. All right. So that's it. That's how we deal with lone pairs. And if you have more than one central atom. Now, to wrap things up. Let's get some conclusions out there. Uh, let's let's talk about what you know. Um, you know what are the big things about Vesper theory? So for Vesper theory, one of one of the pluses is that it's pretty reliable. So it's pretty reliable to give predictions on the shapes of molecules. And the predictions, we're talking about 90% accurate. So that's really good. I mean, it's not a great, I mean, because you still got the 10%, but for the most part, Vesper theory is going to give you an answer that you can work with. Okay. The other cool thing is that it's really easy to use. That's also a really nice benefit too. All you have to do is memorize the tables and you're good to go. But there is a question, and let me get there. Here's our question now. Does electron pair repulsion really determine the shape of the molecule? So does, does electron pair repulsion really determine the shape of a molecule? To answer this, the, to give you a straightforward answer, does it really determine the shape? Yeah, there's, there's some more. It's yes, but. So we need more information. So we actually do need a better theory to describe the shapes of molecules. And so this is actually what we're going to be dealing with next week in next week's videos there's two and this is actually going to push us to one of the boundaries of, of chemistry right now we know that there are two bonding theories that if if vesper theory doesn't work we can use these other two theories and it's going to get us pretty much close to 100 percent. so one of these three theories will get you to the answer that you need and we'll talk more about that next week.